Good evening, um, everyone. Um, and I know we're in different time zones. So it's wonderful to, uh, to, to be with all of you and, uh, and share my thoughts. So it's really a pleasure to be uh, a part of the FTA Science Conference 2020, uh, building a more inclusive world, um, especially the one that values women, supports climate action, and builds community resilience. Now, this has been a part of um, IAX's mission for the past decade, and innovation has been a crucial part of our journey and approach. And I'm gonna share some of those thoughts with you today. Now, interestingly, um, if you think about it, with, um, uh, hold on, my screen is not moving. Just, oh, okay, got it. Um, you know, the state of the world um, pre-COVID, and now again, I say that because of course COVID has been the big disruptor, but interestingly, even at the beginning of the year, if I were sharing these thoughts with you, I would start with this, and I would actually like to share the same thoughts with you, which is what was really the state of the world? Um, and the state of the world, at least on the surface, it seems quite good. Um, there are less people in poverty, um, an all-time low at 10%. There were more people who were connected. There was massive globalization through um, global trade, capital, information. And of course, the world actually went digital. And we had half the global population, um, more than half, 57%, who were using the internet. And more than half of those people, actually about 4 billion of them, um, were users who resided in Asia Pacific. So these were all wonderful news. Now, Interestingly, if you think about it, even pre-COVID, was it really the case that the world was such a wonderful place? And the reality is, no, it was not. So what I just shared with you really was the surface. And if you really just looked under the hood a little bit, um, you saw that the world was actually experiencing a lot of challenges. The, addressing the realities of climate change, where 800 million people were vulnerable to the negative climate um, change impact. And just in a very few months, we had uh, in, in 2020, more than 13,000 square kilometers of the Brazilian Amazon was burned. Now, of course, we are seeing that even in the US right now, there are close to 15,000 firefighters and trying to combat you know, close to 30 major fires across California. So it's, it's just, and of course, with the one typhoon and hurricane after the other. So these are all the things that we got battered and that still are being battered on the climate side. Now, interestingly, if you look at on the biodiversity side, recently um, UN Global Biodiversity Outlook, um, it actually just was, came out last week and it um, shared with us that we basically missed all the critical deadlines to safeguarding biodiversity. None of the 20 targets set in the IG biodiversity targets were met and with only six partially achieved. Now, why did this happen? Because interestingly, apparently some $500 billion that was spent on fossil fuel and other subsidies caused environmental degradation and thus the biodiversity was adversely impacted. Now, if you look at the inequality, again, with all the wonderful results I just started off with, if you looked just a little bit underneath that, you would have seen that even pre-COVID, we had still over 700 million people who were living under $2 a day. And again, most of them were in Asia. And of course, we have now on top of all of that, we have the global pandemic, which has taken you know, close to a million lives across the globe and those numbers are rising. Now, the impact of COVID on the global economy, which again was experiencing an incredible inequality, has taken it to the new level with economies contracting from 20 to 30% already. And of course, the women who are the most vulnerable are now going into even further and deeper poverty. Now, COVID actually has disproportionately impacted women and climate change. Before COVID-19, women were already likely to live in poverty and now making it even harder for them to cope with weather-related shocks, 
along with the pandemic and low carbon technologies. So you have now the vulnerable getting hit even in a man, much worse way. Now, the reason I tell you all this is because not because the fact that, you know, the world is in a bad place, we all know that, but really for you to step back and actually see what can be done about it. All these challenges that we are facing, does it actually mean we have some opportunities to go along with it? The answer is yes. We actually can look at transforming the financial system, the most powerful, powerful body in the planet. We can actually generate inclusive value and we can empower women to be solution builders for climate action. Now, how are we going to do that? Very simply, by disrupting finance. And we can do it and we're showing that we can disrupt finance for inclusive growth. And why finance? Why am I picking finance? Now, this is an interesting chart. If you look at it closely, and it's not drawn to scale because you can't draw this to scale. Um, if you look at it on the right-hand side, that's the global philanthropy, which you know, hovers around half a billion dollars. Now, this does not, of course, take into account some of the, the donor um, agencies who are coming in. This is private philanthropy. Maybe you add another billion to that. So, it really is a number that is extremely small compared on the left side of the screen where you see the global wealth. This is global wealth of everything together. You have all the assets, you have all the stock exchanges, everything together. And you see it's over $360 trillion. That's incredible. $360 trillion on one side where it's creating wealth for the 1% and the 99% of the global population are being exposed to the tiny amount of philanthropy, which is on the right side. Now, having said that, over the last um, 30 years, we have seen some very positive movements in the market. There was a whole notion of socially responsible investing that started almost uh, 40 years ago. Um, where do no harm became one of the big mantras, which was fantastic. And it was really the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa that triggered it. So if you, if you didn't actually invest in uh, gun or alcohol or, or uh, companies which are supporting apartheid, um, those were considered as socially responsible investing. Now that's about $30 trillion. And that now has gone to the next level, which is ESG environmental, social, and governance focus, which is about 40 trillion, where you're going a level deeper and actually keeping making the companies accountable. Now there's no verification, but the companies are actually saying we are doing X, Y, and Z with the environment and socially. Now, interestingly, 10 years ago, this all of this were taken to the new level of debt, and this was through impact investing. This is where the investing is happens with an intention of creating social and environmental good along with the financial return. And that is now a market over the last decade of 715 billion. I will talk a little bit more about that um, a little later. But what's important is if you think about it, the SDG, you know, before COVID even, we knew that we needed $2.5 trillion every year to actually meet the SDG goal. Now that number, God knows what that is. Um, you know, it's probably double or triple that every year. Now, if we have this incredible need um, to meet the SDG goals, and we actually have an incredible gap that cannot be met, and we know that all this wealth is sitting in the capital markets, the question then really is, how do we actually bring that to make it work for everyone? Now, the impact investing movement, as I mentioned, when it started 10 years ago, was really an idea that a group of us came together in Bellagio, Italy, Rockefeller Foundation brought us together. And we were the ones who basically said, we are going to change finance and we're going to do it for good. And it's really heartening to see after a decade, this market is now close to $800 billion and it's growing. So people are waking up to it, the, the investors, the financial markets, the fact that you cannot be looking at finance in a myopic way. So the good news is while all the inequality lasts, 
we can actually, as a group, use this good intentionality and see how we can make it work for everyone. Now, what is actually happening in the market right now? It's good for us to step back and kind of take a look at it. Yes, the corporates are issuing global sustainability bonds. You must be hearing about it. Um, you're hearing about the multilaterals have uh, increased climate finance budget. Wonderful. You're hearing about the MNCs. You know, we're doing a lot of work in the space. But again, let's look a little closer. Interestingly, yes, corporates have issued 35% of the global sustainability bonds. But also, if you look at some of the examples, for example, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, um, who just issued $1 billion of corporate social bond um, focused on COVID, the entire money is only for the BAMO clients and it's not going into SMEs. So interestingly, there is no additionality. And how social then is this bond? I will leave it to you to decide. Um, similarly, if you look at um, organizations like Olam, um, which had secured $250 million of sustainability linked loan in 2020. It's third in two years. And if you look at it at the same time, Olam is one of the big organizations who are responsible for destroying rainforests with palm oil plantations. Now, Google, yes, we think Google is a wonderful company. Well, I don't know. They issued $5.75 billion of sustainability bond the largest ever issued. And the proceeds include, but are not limited to just clean transportation and circular economy and design. The money is just circling by the rich for the rich. In terms of the multilaterals, um, they have increased their climate finance budget to $61 billion. But how much of that is really empowering women? Well, let's look at that. World Bank's Sustainability Development Bonds, it claims to be the largest SDG bond provider in the world. Majority of the World Bank's bond portfolio commitment is allocated towards transportation. That's 22%, followed by energy and extraction, 19%. And in the impact report listed funded project do not address SDG 5, gender equality, even though SDG 5 is listed as a priority to the bond issuers. This is the state of the world now. Now, in terms of the investors allocating a large part of their budget for climate finance, the question is how much of that is really going to the last mile? The world's 35 biggest banks have lent and underwritten $2.7 trillion to oil, gas, and coal companies since the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement it's not going to the last mile for clean energy. Now, if we can't build back better, if we actually can't bring in the MSMEs and the SMEs, especially in the least developed countries, I think the world is in for trouble. We need to use finance to be effectively inclusive. Globally, MSMEs in the formal and informal economy make up over 90% of all the firms and accounts. And even before COVID, SMEs in emerging markets were responsible for creating seven out of the 10 formal jobs. And yet, they faced a $5 trillion annual financing gap. And that number is rising with COVID. At IAX, when we started in that, after that meeting in Bellagio, where the, where the term impact investing was coined, um, I made it my mission to create a company which will be committed to actually valuing people and the planet. It will actually connect the back street to the Wall Street of the world, and it will give a voice to the voiceless. And that is exactly what we have done. Now, yes. Thanks. What is it, Michael? Uh, one minute, please. Okay. So in terms of um, one of the things that um, IX, um, we do many different things, but one of the things that we have done very effectively is creating the Women's Livelihood Bond Series, a series that is effectively connecting half a million women to the financial markets. And we have received many UN awards for this. And again, what it effectively does 
is brings in a village of partners. And again, it takes a village to actually disrupt a financial system. And that's what we have done. Now, in terms of giving a voice to the voiceless, we have created IX values because this is the only way you can actually have a say in the financial market when the impact is measured and that is actually part of the financial instrument that you're creating. So with that, I'm going to actually say, um, for us, our next um, decade's goal is to actually empower half a billion lives, especially for women, unlock um, a billion dollars, which we are very close to, we have already there with uh, over 200 million, educate 10 million people in joining our movement, and avoid 10, 100 million tons of carbon dioxide emission. Now, I leave you with some thoughts. And the thoughts is, what concrete action are you going to take? You have had this conference go on for last one week. And I want to know, in the next one week, what is the commitment that you are taking in terms of actually creating concrete changes to bring climate action and women front and center of the global discussion? Is your research actually inclusive? Is it actually unlocking capital? And are you unlocking capital while protecting people and the planet? These are all the things for you to question, think about, and have solution to. And I know you will. So thank you very much. And let's all together build climate resilience and an effective economy for all. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much, Doreen, for that very interesting presentation. Doreen uh, Bass was uh, curious, what mm -hmm. research do to upscale the work and, and the work of organizations such as uh, IIX? So what, what, what research can we support you with? That would be a first question. Yes, so I think, you know, any work, any sort of financial instrument actually starts with looking at first what the problem is. So I think what makes um, the work that we do unique is the fact that we actually start with the problem. And in this case, when we created IX, the problem was the fact that women and women's livelihood was not a part of the financial system. So the research work that you can do um, is really being able to figure out what the problem is and not really dwell on the risks. I think this is something that I have seen in a lot of the materials I went through for the conference and also a lot of the materials that C4 and your partners have produced, um, risk is wonderful to actually think about, but then also you have to think of what's the risk mitigators. How do we actually use effective um, partners and financial structures to mitigate risk? So I think um, it's very important to do the research, not just the sake of research for unveiling the issues and the problems, but I would say to also think of solutions and effective solutions. Okay? okay. Great. Well, thank you all. I really appreciated the, the time and the discussion.